Hello, my name is Elaine Evans. I am an extension educator at the University of Minnesota. And today I am presenting a piece of the Pollinator Educator Toolkits that we've been working on. There are a couple different components to these toolkits. There are both physical components and online components. So what I'm gonna be talking about today, the Pollinator Diversity Cards, for those of you who have received the physical kits, there are um, physical cards that are um, these Pollinator Diversity Cards with the goal being to introduce people to a wide variety of pollinators that we have in Minnesota. There is also an online component. So this is a PowerPoint presentation, an online pre slide presentation that will be available to, um, to anyone who'd like to use it, whether or not you have the, the physical kits. And um, today what I'll be doing is going through the, this um, presentation to give you an overview and some more details of what, um, what, what the content is for this presentation so that you as a pollinator educator can take this material and use it with your audiences in ways that you think works best for them. So um, this, this front card of the pollinator diversity cards has a variety of different pollinators here. There are bees, there's wasps, there's flies. The pollinator toolkits overall have been supported by funding from the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. So um, we appreciate you pointing that out when you're using these materials so that um, proper credit can go to them for supporting this project. The content for this was put together by the Department of Entomology at the University of Minnesota and the, the Bee Lab. And more information about the Pollinator Ambassador Toolkits can be gotten at the link here, z.umn.edu backslash Pollinator Ambassador. So I'm starting out here with some background on pollinators. So um, what are pollinators? So pollinators are animals that are moving pollen between flowers. So there's an illustration here kind of demonstrating um, flowers where a bee is picking up pollen in one flower and bringing it to another flower and showing how that ends up helping that plant to produce seeds and fruit and um, that then is connected to, to food that we eat. It also has this broader connection where pollinators are pollinating 80% of the plants that are out there in the world. And those plants in turn um, support a lot of different um, animals and um, they, they um, connect to a lot of different different creatures out there. And these plants are also crucial for soil and water health. So you can zoom out to this big picture of how pollinators help. So our showing that our, not just us and our food, but our ecosystem depends on healthy and diverse pollinator populations. So we have um, a few different groups of pollinators that we'll be going over in the pollinator diversity cards. We'll be talking about bees. Bees are one of the few pollinators that are really intentionally collecting pollen because they take the pollen back home to feed their young. So because of this, bees tend to move more pollen than many of the other pollinators. A lot of the other pollinators are attracted to flowers to get nectar and they get some pollen on them and happen to move it around, but they aren't intentionally collecting pollen in a lot of cases. Um, flies are a good example of that. So flies are going and collecting nectar. A lot of times flies, the flowers that you'll see the most attracted to are ones that smell like 
rotting meat or dung because um, there are a lot of flies that, that um, lay their eggs and things like that. Flies, however, do um, end up on flowers a lot and um, they do move a lot of pollen around, especially because they can be there in high abundances. So we're learning a lot more about how important flies are for both crop pollination and for just wild pollination. Butterflies and moths are another example. You can see here the way this, this um, moth is visiting the flower, you can see they're not getting in contact with a lot of pollen because the tongue is just kind of going right in and, and getting the nectar. They're not getting their body in there and getting a bunch of pollen on it. But they do pick up pollen. And one of the benefits of butterflies and moths as pollinators is that they oftentimes fly farther than other pollinators. So they can be really important for genetic diversity in wild plants where these um, moths and butterflies are moving pollen at a greater distance. Wasps, besides pollinating, can also be really important with providing pest control. There are um, wasps that, um, that besides getting nectar from flowers, they're going out and eating, um, eating insects other insects that um, might be pests on, on crops or in gardens. Beetles um, aren't a group that we'll talk about a bunch in the rest of the cards, but they are, um, they are present on flowers and it's something that I'm sure um, anyone who's out looking at flowers in, in Minnesota will see a goldenrod soldier beetle like this at some point in time because there are so many of them out there. Beetles are among the first insects that were out pollinating flowers when, um, po when flowers first evolved around 140 million years ago. So that relationship goes back a long ways. There are birds that, that pollinate. So in Minnesota, we have some hummingbirds that are pollinators. And um, one thing to note about pollinator flowers that are um, bird pollinated is they tend to be red and they often have little or no scent. Bats can be important pollinators in deserts and in tropical systems, but even though we have bats in Minnesota, we don't have any bats in Minnesota that are pollinators. I'm going to go through uh, the kind of anatomy of the pollinator diversity cards so you can get an idea of what we have on these cards. The front part of the card and the first slide that'll come up it, through the slideshow are photos of the pollinators. A note here is that all of these photos are from iNaturalist, so they are all from community scientists that were participating and um, sharing their pictures through iNaturalist, which is something that we hope you encourage uh, the people that you're working with to, to get out and do. We have the, um, the both the common name and the scientific name of the insect. So sometimes it is just the, the genus when we're talking about a whole um, multiple species within a, um, a genus. And we also have the approximate number of species that we have in Minnesota. So all of these numbers are approximate because we're still learning more and things are always changing. There are new species moving in as, um, as climate change, as people move things around, we'll, we'll get new species moving in. Um, but as of 2020, when we're putting this together, this is our best information in terms of the, the number of species within that group that we have in Minnesota. We have this section called key characteristics, and that really goes over how to identify that insect. So, um, so we have some, some simple things that people can look for to get to know um, 
know what these what these insects look like and also some things that they can com commonly be confused with so things to keep an eye out for if you if you think you're seeing what this is to, to double check against these other things we have a little bit of information on how they live so um, if you have an audience that's really curious about biology and wants to know more there are um, you know just a few sentences here about some basic things about how these different creatures live we also have size ranges and on the physical cards they actually they represent the actual sizes um, in the presentation it'll just give you um, a, a general comparative idea and it has the, the numbers in millimeters but um, but you can get a general idea of, of the size range and, and what to expect to see out there. We also have some fascinating features, some fun facts that can spark people's curiosity. So I'm gonna start just going through briefly these, these different um, pollinator diversity cards. So we're starting out with this insect, which is a pretty familiar insect, bumblebee. So Bumblebees, we have around 23 different species. A lot of people recognize them as being these large, very fuzzy insects, often black and yellow. One thing to look for are the pollen baskets on the back of their legs. So um, if we go back here, you can see on the, the set of legs she has that are back kind of closest to her abdomen, there, um, there is a wider section there that kind of looks like a triangle and is flat and broad and has these long hairs that are set up around the, the edge of the leg. And that is her pollen basket, which is present only on the females. Bumblebees, there are lots of things that like to look like bumblebees. So there are longhorned bees, mining bees, and flies that do a pretty good job of mimicking and, and looking like bumblebees. Bumblebees are a social native insect. So they live in colonies that can have um, 50 to maybe up to 1,000 bees. Usually it's, it's around 50 bees kind of at the peak. Um, but each colony only is starting from one bee that survived the winter. So the queens are the only ones that survived the winter and they start up each colony um, on their own every year. The daughters then stay in the nest to raise their sister and that's what makes them a social insect and that's what makes that colony happen. The fun fact we have here is that queen bumblebees to survive the winter they actually have antifreeze in their blood that keeps them from from freezing. The next insect we have here is a hummingbird moth. So there are four different species of hummingbird moths that we have in Minnesota. They have, um, to tell them apart from other pollinators, they have no waist to speak of. Um, bees and wasps will have a, a thin waist between their thorax and their abdomen. They have really broad wings. Their behavior is different where they'll really hover in front of the flower like hummingbirds. And um, they're most often confused with bumblebees and also hummingbirds. So, so zooming back here, you can see that lack of waste. Um, you can see um, for, for bees and wasps, they have elbowed antennae. These are really straight antennae. You can also sometimes notice that really long tongue and when they're not sticking it in a flower, it gets all kind of curled up. So these um, hummingbird moths, they lay tiny round green eggs on plants. And when the caterpillars are fully grown, they'll drop to the ground and spin a loose cocoon and pupate there protected by leaf litter. So this is one of the insects that benefits from you leaving leaves in your yard. Leaving leaf, leaf litter just in your garden over the winter through till about June, if there's spots in your garden where you can leave it, will provide a shelter for that pollinator to, to survive. The fun fact here for these guys, when these they first emerge, their wings are actually covered with scales. So they don't have those clear wings that look like bee wings. But, um, but as they're, they're flying around, those scales fall off, making them um, 
making them look a lot more like bees than they would otherwise. This is our next pollinator. You can see a thin waist there. This is a digger wasp. We have two different species of digger wasps in Minnesota. So they all have those long abdomens and the thin waists. There um, are a few different color patterns that they can get. Um, they may be all black, they, or they may be black with um, red, yellow, or white. They're most often confused with paper wasps. And these um, digger wasps, they visit the flowers to not only eat nectar, but they also are, are going after pollen. But the, the larvae eat other insects. So the adult wasp will paralyze insects and bring them back to the nest to, to feed their young, um, these, these paralyzed insects. And um, one interesting thing here, the fun fact here is um, this behavior that they do where people have, have looked at what they do and um, you know, they have these, these um, behaviors that seem to be, be pretty complicated, but you know, their brains are pretty tiny and um, you can actually see that um, their, their behaviors are really limited by, um, by their surroundings. They're not able to, to figure things out and come up with new adaptations. When they're dragging those insect prey, by, they grab them by the antennae of the insect. And um, if, the in, if the antennae of the insect are cut off, the wasp just doesn't know what to do with the wasp, the behavior pattern that they have. They just know to grab the antennae. They don't know to just go and grab a leg. So this is interesting in terms of seeing what, um, how insects live and how their, um, their behavior sets are, are really different than, um, than how human brains work. Here is our next insect pollinator. Giving you a second to guess what it is. This is a flower fly. So there's lots of different flower flies, over 125 different species of flower flies. They're all in the family Syrphidae. Flower flies are not very hairy. They have really large eyes and small antennae. There's a lot of variation in size and coloration. A lot of them are yellow and have black stripes on their abdomen. You don't see them carrying a lot of pollen, but they, um, they can be really good mimics of bumblebees and honeybees and other bees as well. An interesting thing with their biology is that both the larvae and the adults are be beneficial. So flower fly larvae are predaceous on other insect pests, especially, especially like aphids and other plant pests. And then the adults are pollinators. So you get this double benefit of pest control and pollination with flower flies. The fun fact for these guys, not only do they look like bees, but a lot of them also make buzzing sounds. Um, they can't sting, but a lot of animals just leave them alone anyway. Give you a second, look at this one. This is a green metallic sweat bee. We have four different species in the genus Agapostamon. There are, just, just for your information, there are a couple other genera that we have in Minnesota of sweat bees that are green and metallic. Um, but within this genus of Agapostamon, we only have, have four species. And um, they're the most, the more common ones. And um, these guys have the green metallic head and thorax. Sometimes the, the abdomen can be a green metallic. The one we're showing here has this black abdomen with some, some yellow striping. The females have the pollen collecting hairs on the upper parts of their back legs. So sometimes I talk about that as being in their, in their armpits on their back legs. Green metallic bees can be confused with metallic flies and wasps. A lot of times people um, just, they know the, the green metallic flies and they assume these guys are flies, but um, these guys, when you see a lot of pollen on them and, um, and you know, they're shaped more like a bee, they're a green metallic sweat bee. These 
insects are communal, so they are further up on that social scale, not quite to the level that the bumblebees are, but there will be multiple females that share the same nest and they'll, they'll stay behind. But unlike the bumblebees, these bees will just take care of their own young inside the nest. So there aren't queens and workers. Most of the bees we have in Minnesota are solitary. They don't have queens and workers. It's mostly just um, honeybees and bumblebees that have um, queens and workers in terms of our, our Minnesota bumblebees. Some, a lot of people wonder why are they called sweat bees? And that is because they are actually attracted to, to human sweat. And it's thought that the, there's salt and other minerals, even protein, that they're able to get from sweat from mammals. So they will, will show up on you in the summertime and, um, and take advantage of the, um, the nutrients that, that you're giving off. Here is our next bee. This is a leafcutter bee. This is a pretty diverse group of bees. There are about 22 different species in Minnesota. These guys, to tell them apart from other bees, they have these really large, stout bodies. The females have the pollen collecting hairs on their bellies, which you can kind of see from the side here. Um, the, all that kind of fuzzy stuff on the bottom of her abdomen, that's all her pollen collecting hairs. You, so you can see her legs there have a little bit of pollen, but not much. They don't have, um, have, have really big pollen collecting hair brushes like a lot of the other bees do. The, their abdomens also taper to a point at the end. The, if you see males out, the front legs of, of the males are often bright white or yellow and often very hairy. So those guys can be really distinct. Leafcutter bees can be confused with longhorn bees, honeybees, and mining bees. So these guys are solitary. They make their nests in stems or in the ground and the young are each sealed into their own cells from pieces of leaves. So that's why these bees are called leafcutter bees. So each little baby bee will get its own pollen ball and it'll be sealed into a rolled up piece of pieces of leaves and um, they'll be chewed up leaves that are used as a cap. And so if you're ever out looking at plants and you notice these holes, to me, it always reminds me of, uh, of paper cutters. They, they can be perfect circles sometimes. Those are um, leaf cutter bees that are taking those, those, um, those pieces of leaves and bringing them back to the nest. They do seem to like certain plants. So um, I see them a lot on, on roses doing this but um, we are still kind of learning about what are their, um, what plants do they, do they really prefer to use? And if you visit the Bee Lab website, we have a handout that lists some of the plants that we know that, that bees use for, for, um, for stem nesting. And um, as we learn more about what they use for, for leaves, we'll be sharing that information as well. This is, next bee is very popular. This is the honeybee, Apis mellifera. So a note here that they are not native to the United States. Um, the other pollinators we're talking about here are. So um, in, in general, there are some, um, some imported, some, some non-native um, megachile leafcutter bees that have, have moved in, but anyway. Honeybees are, um, most people are familiar with their biology, um, they, but some people don't know how variable they can be and how they look. So they can be that kind of um, amber color like that, but they can also be really dark. So they can be almost all dark brown, um, but they also have those pollen baskets like, the, like we saw on the bumblebees. They're sometimes confused with longhorn bees, mining bees, leaf gutter bees. There are fly mimics, um, yellow jackets, and, and other wasps. So um, I mentioned that they're not native to the United States. The honeybees we have here were brought over from Europe for honey and wax production. But today, most of the colonies we have here are, are actually managed for crop pollination. 
So they are social. They have one queen and many, many daughters. The colonies can be up to 50,000, 60,000 bees at the height of their population in the summer. And Minnesota is one of the top 700 producing, honey producing states in the US. So there are lots of beekeepers, lots of honey being produced here in Minnesota. Honeybees have so many different fascinating things that they do, but one of the most fascinating is the dance language they have, where they tell other bees the location and quality of flowers, um, leading other foragers to the best food sources in the landscape. This next one is, is another iconic Minnesota pollinator. It is our Minnesota state insect, the monarch butterfly. So um, there are other butterflies that mimic most famously the, the viceroy um, and um, the viceroys have a, a black lines in their, in their hind wings that the, that the monarchs do. The, um, the female butterfly will lay between 100 and 300 eggs in her lifetime and will, she only lays them on milkweed plants. Um, a, a small fraction of those eggs actually survive, so the, the caterpillars stay on the, the, the milkweed eating for five days and then they'll move to sheltered areas where they pupate into adult butterflies and then as adults the monarchs need more than milkweed. They'll actually visit a lot of different plants to, to drink nectar. And um, one of the coolest things about monarchs is this migration that they do. So the monarchs that we see here in Minnesota are, um, they are from a population that are migrating to Mexico for the winter. And so they're, um, they'll, they return back to Minnesota in, in April and, um, from the, the monarchs that left here to the ones that return, there are four different generations that have passed um, for, on, on their way to and, and from Mexico. This next one um, is, is kind of tricky for people. It's not very fuzzy like most other bees, but this is a bee. This is a masked bee. You can see from the size here, they're one of the smaller bees that we have here in Minnesota. There are 14 different species. So these guys are small. They're mostly confused with wasps. They're mostly black and they have that those yellow patterns on their face. They actually um, don't have any pollen collecting hairs. These bees actually carry pollen back home in their stomach that then they regurgitate and feed to their young. So this, this group of bees, the mast bees, were the first bees that were granted protection from um, by the U.S. Endangered Species Act. And um, not, not any of the ones that we have in Minnesota, but there were seven species of ma masked bees that are only found in Hawaii and are, um, are protected by the Endangered Species Act. Here is our next bee. You can see it has a lot more fuzzy hair collecting pollen. This is a long-horned bee, also sometimes called a chap-legged bee. So there are our stout, small to medium-sized bees. Um, the, the females have those really dense, hairy back legs on kind of the bottom, um, bottom part of their legs below their knees. The males are um, what give them the name longhorned bees. So we don't have a picture of them here, but the males have very long antennae. Um, longhorned bees in general can be confused with leaf cutter bees, honeybees, bumblebees, mining bees. They um, are also solitary bees. They nest in the ground and they're actually more common late in the summer. So you won't see these guys much until um, till late June, July. And um, so they are, are solitary, bringing pollen back to the, to the nest, laying an egg on it. And the larvae will emerge and feed on that pollen and stay in there till the following summer when they come out um, as adults. 
One fun fact here with the long horned bees is that many of them are specialists, meaning that they will only visit sunflowers and asters. They, you may see them on other flowers for nectar, but when they're collecting pollen, it's mostly just from, from sunflowers and asters, and their larvae actually need that pollen to develop. If they um, are fed pollen from another plant, the larvae can't develop. They need sunflower family, plant, plant family um, pollen. Here is our next pollinator. This one is a paper wasp. We have two different species of paper wasps. So they have these, these thin waists, um, very little ha hair, really long legs. Um, they can be confused with, with digger wasps and other wasps mostly. So they build these distinctive paper nests that are just a single horizontal comb that's attached um, by a stalk to a surface. So a lot of times they are up under the eaves of people's houses or garages. You've most likely seen one of these nests at some point in time. They, they are um, not large nests. The caterpillars um, are, are, are one of their main things they like to eat. So the adults will go out and hunt for, for soft-bodied insects and chew them up and feed them to their larvae. So these guys are highly social like the, the bumblebees and honeybees. They do have queens and workers, but um, the queens and workers here are actually the same size. And so it's um, harder to tell who it is unless you look at how they behave. So the differences uh, are in their behavior where um, queens are more aggressive towards workers and prevent them from, from laying eggs so that the queen is the only one who is laying eggs. Here is our next bee. These, this is mining bees, a really diverse group. So we've got 82 different species of mining bees in Minnesota. They're medium-sized bees. One thing that I that I that sticks out to me when I'm looking at these guys is they have this distinctive kind of flattened abdomen. You can see from the angle of this photo, um, at on the top of the abdomen, it just gets it has this kind of squished look. Another thing is that they have these patches of hairs on the, the front of their faces called um, facial phobi. So they have these, these velvety spots right kind of by their eyes and their pollen collecting hairs are on the upper parts of their back legs. So here you can see there's, there's pollen kind of spilling over past the upper part of the, of the back leg, but that most of the pollen collecting hairs are kind of up in that armpit area and not on the lower part of the back back leg like we saw in the longhorned bees. Um, but these guys can be confused with longhorn bees, honeybees, bumblebees. These are some of the first bees that you'll see in the spring as soon as flowers open. You can start seeing mining bees. But there are different species that emerge through the summer. The adults are active only for a couple weeks, so we do have a lot of different species that are coming out at different times through the year. So the rest of the year, when we're not seeing them, those immature bees are in the nests underground developing. So um, there are not only diverse in Minnesota, but diverse worldwide. There's over 1,300 different types of mining bees in the world. It is one of the largest um, bee genera. Here is a, another pollinator that um, will be familiar to a lot of people, which is the yellow jacket. We ha actually have nine different species of yellow jackets here in, um, in Minnesota. They are black and yellow striped. They are less hairy than bees and have thinner legs. Um, people often confuse them with, with honeybees. A lot of times, honestly, the, the um, Stings that people get from, from yellow jackets, people blame on bees. So they're, they're highly social. They, um, these guys do tend to be defensive around their paper nests, which are, are much larger nests that tend to be located either in trees or underground. But the colonies do die out each fall after several frosts. And like the bumblebees are started from just the solitary queens in the spring. So these guys are sometimes mistakenly called bees given that they're similar in size and general coloration, but these yellow jackets are actually wasps. 
here is our next bee. This is another popular bee, the mason bee. They're also called orchard bees, um, mason orchard bees. They, we and a pretty diverse group with 18 different species. They are um, stocky and really broad headed, dark metallic blue or green. Sometimes they can appear black. You'll notice when you see a pollen on them, um, you can kind of see a little bit of pollen. It's um, on her abdomen is where she has her pollen collecting hairs as opposed to her, her leg. The, with their metallic color, they're sometimes confused with metallic sweat bees. There's another metallic bee, the small carpenter bees. And these guys are called mason bees because they use mud to construct their nests. And those nests are often in cracks or crevices. Um, they'll sometimes use um, hollow stems or holes in wood. And these guys are, are famous for being super efficient pollinators. So 300 of these mason bees can move as much pollen as two honeybee hives. And we talked about the honeybee hives having um, 50 to 60,000 workers per hive. So you can see if um, you know 300 of these mason bees can move as, as much pollen as, um, as 100,000 honeybees. Here is our next bee, another metallic one. So these are the small carpenter bees. We have three different species. They are dark metallic blue. They are not very hairy, but they do have um, pollen collecting hairs on their legs. They often have a white mark in the middle of their face. For these guys, um, for their abdomen, they have this really kind of barrel shaped abdomen. So it's kind of the opposite of what I was talking about with the mining bees, where these guys have a really rounded, um, especially rounded abdomen, um, sometimes with a little point at the end. So these guys make their nests in, in um, dead wood or in stems. So they use broken stems with soft centers. And sometimes you can see the females guarding the nest at the entrance of the stem. They'll just have their head sticking out the end of the stem. So these guys have this, this really cool thing that some species do where there are several species of carpenter bees that are able to produce females without mating. So um, bees in general are able to produce males without mating. They, any female can, can lay an egg and have it, and if it's not fertilized, it will become a male. But um, these guys are also be able to produce um, females from unfertilized eggs. So there are some populations of these bees that have almost no males. So um, ultimate in, in girl power. We're moving into a couple of vertebrates. So um, this is a hummingbird. So um, really big compared to the other sizes of things that we're showing. So the ruby-throated hummingbird, um, the, the males have um, the ruby red throat and white collar and a forked tail. The female has a green back and tail feathers that are banded. Um, so these guys mostly drink nectar in terms of, of being pollinators, but they also will eat small insect and spiders, and they are mostly visiting red, orange, or bright pink flowers. So these guys, um, anybody who's spent time watching hum hummingbirds has seen what incredible flyers they are. So the wings um, connect to the body only at the shoulder joint. So their, their wings can rotate almost 180 degrees. So that's what enables them to fly forward and backward and hover. So, so their wings are actually functionally a lot more like um, insect wings than, than, um, than other birds. One thing that we hope that your people will um, take away from this is that um, it will get them out looking at all these different pollinators. So I went through a lot of the details on the cards. As you're using this with your audience, feel free to just use whatever you want. Maybe you just want to focus on the ID. Maybe you just want to focus on fun facts. Um, whatever it is that um, you think would be best for your audience, feel free to use this in whatever way. We do hope that you can encourage people to get out there in their, in their backyards or their favorite parks 
and out looking for pollinators, um, looking at a bunch of different flowers, taking photos and sharing on the iNaturalist app or the iNaturalist website. And um, we hope that you can encourage people to plant more flowers and more varieties of flowers so that they can find more of these pollinators and try to do the best they can to get that whole diversity of the pollinators that we have in Minnesota showing up at their individual gardens. So, um, so thank you for, um, for, for using these materials. If you have ways that you, you've used this that you wanna share with us, um, that would be great for us to learn, learn how um, you're able to use, use these tools and um, check back in at, um, with Pollinator Ambassadors, the University of Minnesota at the, the B Lab website, blab.umn.edu to um, stay up to date with what we're um, producing to help you help people help pollinators.